Please take your Bibles and turn with me, if you will, back to that portion of Scripture we read out of the book of Exodus just a few moments ago, Exodus chapter 15, <clears throat> verses 22 through 27. We're looking at part 39 of the Bitter Waters and Sweet. Three weeks ago on August 26, of course, we had part 38. Then two weeks ago was our guest speaker, Reverend Bob Hager. And then last week was guest speaker, Reverend Ken Olson. And so we're back to Bitter Waters and Sweet, Naomi in the Desert. And indeed, it is a, an amazing journey that Israel is taking as she goes through the desert, 40 years in the desert. We haven't even done 40 weeks in looking at it. You think of all that transpired in the 40 years in the desert. And the reason they had to stay so long in the desert was because of the 10 times that they tempted God. 10 times. I hope we get to number seven today. We want to finish up number six. But we're going to discover something extremely interesting, I hope, painfully interesting about these 10 times that Israel put God to the test in the desert. And the reason that God said, all right, they've tempted me 10 times, so I'm not going to let them go into the promised land. Everybody who's over age 20 is going to die in the wilderness. Two exceptions, Joshua and Caleb. But everybody else, including Moses and Aaron and Miriam, they all died in the desert. And there was one central sin that kept them from going into the promised land. You remember, Paul tells us these things were written for our admonition. These things were examples for us. God didn't write the Old Testament merely to record Israel's history. God recorded the Old Testament so that we would understand who God is and what he expects of his people. And what he does to his people when they obey him for blessing. And what he does to his people when they disobey him. Sobering lessons. Those ten failures of Israel and the other examples given in the Old Testament were written for us in the church. Now these things were our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. Again in verse 11, now these all thamp things happened unto them for examples and they're written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. Peter says the same thing in 2 Peter 2. God repeats the warning in the book of Jude that these things are set forth for an example. And that's what brought us to rebellion test number five, which I hope we'll be able to finish today. That was the golden calf. The first thing we learned about the golden calf dealt with impatience. That's a serious example for us today because that's one of the prime tests that Israel failed in the wilderness. Impatience always gets you into trouble and it always gets you out of the will of God. Then you recall I went over 16 key lessons that the Bible teaches about patience. We noted that these can be boiled down into three key principles. Patience is absolutely essential to the victorious Christian life. Impatience always leads to rebelling against the will of God and landing in carnal sin. Impatience is involved in every one of the ten failures of Israel in the wilderness. Third, patience has two sides. First, it means you refrain from natural impulses. And on the other side, you carefully examine your options to make sure that the choice you make fits with biblical principles. Then finally, we contrasted patience with sloth. Patience is not sloth for three reasons. Number one, because the Bible sets patience in contrast to sloth. Number two, patience has to be exercised by faith to obtain the promises of God. And of course, walking by faith is never sloth. And number three, God not only commands patience, but he actively does things in our lives to develop patience. And he always uses suffering in that process of development. The second major lesson we learned from the golden calf 
is that compromising leadership always bends to politically correct pressure. In 2 Timothy 4, 1 through 4, we saw that Paul warned the Christians today to beware of apostates who tickle the itching ears of the compromising church. The third lesson we learned from the golden calf is that people always support bad leadership and bad theology financially if it gives them a feel-good experience. And the correlate to that was that compromisers rarely support good leadership and good theology financially if they are walking in the flesh. Number four, the fourth thing we learned from the golden calf is that weak religious leaders will change their theology for cash. And in order to do that, they of course have to sanctify sin to make it seem acceptable. And we went through uh, eight different points that related to how a compromising leader sanctifies sin. And we ended by looking at burnt offerings and peace offerings that they brought to worship the golden calf and saw that neither of those related to the sins of the worshipers. The burnt offerings related to surrender to the God that you are worshiping and the peace offerings related to fellowship to show that you are in fellowship with the God that you were worshiping. And we know that what the people were excited about was that this new God that they had was going to allow them to get involved in immorality. And Paul quotes that passage in 1 Corinthians 10, 6, the passage out of Exodus 32, 22 through 28, where finally, because the people were fornicating, Moses called for all those who stood on the side of the Lord and the Levites gathered themselves together and went in and out of the camp and slew 3,000 men. And God killed more. God sent an additional plague to kill the people. God plagued the people because they made the calf which Aaron made. And we need to remember, because the New Testament has a lot of examples of this, we need to remind you that God still kills people today who claim to be Christians and were having sex outside of marriage like they were doing there in the wilderness. And God uses the devil to do that. And we studied 1 Corinthians 5, verses 4 through 11 on that subject. Now let me say a little bit more about the plague because God also killed additional people with the plague. And uh, God consumed them with the plague. What did he use? We saw that that word means a blow or a fatal disease. We talked about how it's the idea when God sent the plague, this word that's used for plague is where God is beating them. It's the idea of an overlord smacking a servant with a big stick. God was doing this to Israel. That's the word that's used for plague here. He struck, hit them with a blow or a fatal disease. He was beating the living daylights out of them for their immorality. In fact, God tells Moses that he's so furious that he wants to kill every one of them. But Moses begged him not to do it. Because if God had done that, Moses gives three arguments why God shouldn't. Number one, God was the one who delivered the Jews from Egypt. We just read that in verse 11 a minute ago. He had declared to the people that he would and was able to bring them into the promised land. So number one, the promises of God were at stake. Number two, the character of God was at stake because pagans would badmouth God if he annihilated the Jews. And third, the covenants of God were at stake. God would have to violate the covenant that he made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, which would mean that God was either a liar or incompetent or impotent to fulfill his covenants. And those are the three arguments that Moses makes so that God would not kill everybody. And God had offered Moses a little temptation there. Well, I shouldn't say temptation, but he tested Moses' character because he said, Moses, I'll kill all of them and I'll start over with you. We can forget Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We'll start with Moses. Hey, you're Jewish. You're a Levite. Hey, that's great. Let's start all over again. And Moses said no. Moses was more interested in the promises, the character, and the covenants of God. He was more interested in God retaining his integrity in the eyes of the nations than he was in personal aggrandizement, in personal gain. I suspect most of us would not have been able to stand up to that, especially if the people had treated us the way the children of Israel treated Moses. And I gave you an example about 
some prayer principles. Moses' petition taught some very important prayer principles that are found all over the Bible. You can always pray correctly applied promises of God back to him. Those are promises that are based in his word, not in how you feel about something, but promises that are based in his word. You can always pray these things back to God. I hope you do that when you pray. I hope as you read through the Bible, you say, wow, here is a fantastic prayer principle. And whatsoever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men, knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Christ. But he that doeth wrong shall receive for the wrong which he hath done, and there is no respect of persons. Say, wow, Lord, you've promised that if I do this heartily as to you and not unto men, I'm going to get a reward for this. You've also made a second promise there in that verse that if I do wrong, you're going to take note of that too. Ooh, that reminds me of what happened to Israel in the wilderness. In fact, there's no respect to... God didn't even respect Moses. God, God killed Moses for hitting the rock on the second occasion. There's no respect of persons. God, please keep me from ever violating the principles of your word like Moses did where he disobeyed in what seemed to be a very little thing but, but God please keep me from that because that cost Moses his life that cost Moses the privilege of going into the promised land he saw it but he couldn't enter in take the promises of God that apply to you not to somebody else not to Israel the promises that apply to you and you can pray those back to God and you'll see your faith growing as he answers those things in your life. I gave you one illustration over in Psalm 2.8 which has nothing to do with us and it certainly is not a missionary verse. Ask of me and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. I started hearing that verse all the way back at the Christian high school I attended. I heard it all the way through college and praise the Lord, I didn't hear it that way when I was at Dallas Seminary. But I've attended a lot of missions conferences that have used Psalm 2.8. But that was not given to us. It was given to Christ by the Father. Yet I have set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree the Lord has said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. That's clearly a reference to Christ. It's quoted multiple times in the New Testament as referring to Jesus. And he says, this day have I begotten thee, ask of me. He's speaking to the king on the holy hill of Zion. He's speaking to the one who is called the son. And he says to him, ask of me and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. And it's not for salvation. It's for judgment. The context is the second coming of Christ, not the middle of the church age. And it's the context of judgment because the next verse tells us that Jesus is going to smash the nations. It's not about Christian saving nations. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Not all the promises in the book are yours and you're, hopefully you're glad that they're not. And I gave you illustrations of promises that are to Egypt. Some promises are to Ethiopia. Some promises are to apostates and what God's going to do to them and how he's going to throw them into hell. In other words, not all the promises in the book are yours and you don't want all those promises. But you can claim any promise that has been given to you, not to somebody else or some other group, but every promise in Scripture that is given to you. And you must always apply the promise in the correct context. These are very important prayer principles because I know many people who beat their breasts and say, oh, why doesn't God answer my prayer? Well was the promise to you? Is the context of the uh, promise the correct context? Is the promise that you're trying to claim so that you can indulge your own flesh or so that you can bring greater glory to God? You know, the devil answers fleshly prayers. He'll give you some stuff if he knows it will corrupt you. He'll give you things if he knows he can take it and twist you so that you get out of the center of God's will and focus on the temporal instead of on the eternal. 
correct context. Here's a promise that God has given to you. If any of you lack faith, uh, lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. That is a promise. Do you understand that wisdom is the bottom line key for everything else in the Christian life? I mean, after you're saved, wisdom is the key for everything else in the successful, victorious Christian life. The devil's going to try to give you false wisdom. But God has given you wisdom. All the wisdom you need is here. And God has promised that as you study this, the Holy Spirit will give you understanding. It's the doctrine of illumination, where you understand the scripture. The Holy Spirit will bring to your attention areas of your life where that wisdom needs to be applied so that you're not walking in the flesh, but that you're walking in the Spirit. So after you get the wisdom, the next thing you have to do is you must obey. The Christian life is not doing your own thing. You're saved, you're on your way to heaven, it doesn't matter what you do now, you cannot lose your security, you are eternally secure. No. Wisdom says, now that I'm saved, I know I've only got a certain number of days left before I die. Father, give me wisdom to know how, within the context of the remaining span of my life, to apply the principles of your word so that every day, every waking minute, is filled with something for the glory of Christ, for the praise of God, for outreach to the lost, for edification of believers and exhortation and comfort. And when I go to sleep at night that I won't look back with regret at anything that I've thought or said or done, any of my attitudes, any of my motives, every part of it, all five areas, will be to the glory of Jesus Christ. Wisdom is the key. Let him ask in faith. Ah, oh, yes. Everything in the Christian life is related to faith, isn't it? Your salvation is by faith. Your sanctification is by faith. Your spiritual gifts are by faith. One of the fruit of the Spirit is faith. Faith is the standard for Christian practice as well as for Christian belief. And requests in prayer must be brought in faith. Nothing wavering. Now remember, faith is not believing something that God has not promised. Faith is believing what God has promised. Not, you sit and look at your house and you say, man, I got some bad cracks in the foundation. I'm going to have faith that, that the termites are going to come and bring a lot of dirt and stuff it into the crack. Kind of a weird thought, but anyway. And so that the, the house won't have any bigger cracks. And so you pray. And you look, and the termites, they're not there. You know, supporting the foundation, they're, they're eating the boards. Faith relates to the promises of God. If you don't know the promises of God, you cannot pray in faith. You read the promises of God and you say, God, I need wisdom to understand the promises of God. I'm asking in faith because you've promised to help me understand your word so that I can live for the glory of Christ. These are practical principles of the Christian life. They are essential principles of the Christian life. Let him ask in faith nothing wavering, for he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. God's going to say no to all your requests if you don't come in faith. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. So God always answers prayers with a yes that are prayed in accordance with his word. This is the confidence that we have in him, 1 John 5, 14 and 15. That if we have it in heaven, him, that if we ask anything according to his will, where is God's will revealed? This is the only place where you know the specific will of God. 
For example, for this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that ye should abstain from fornication. You know that's the will of God. It says so in the New Testament. And that covers all forms of immorality, porneia, the word from which we get pornography, covers all forms of immorality, starting in your head and coming out in your hands finally. Okay, so that brings us to today. There are three more statements in the context in Exodus 15 that tie in with our text in Exodus. The first one is the sin unto death. Now remember the the test that we're looking at with the golden calf is God's killing people and he only ended up killing the people who committed the sex sins and you clearly know from the New Testament he still kills Christians from sex sins. The second is not only the sin unto death, the second is the connection to petitions and prayers. Who do you pray for and who do you not pray for? I hope you're aware that there are some sinning Christians that you are told not to pray for them. I'll give you an illustration. 1 John 5, 16. If any man see his brother sin a sin which is not unto death, he shall ask and he shall give him life for them that sin not unto death. There is a sin unto death. I do not say that he shall pray for it. All unrighteousness is sin, and there is a sin not unto death. But folks, there is some sin that is a sin unto death. A sin unto death, and I've given a long series on this in the past, so let me just summarize it for you. A sin unto death is a sin whereby the sinner has been warned. Whereby the sinner has been warned multiple times. Whereby the sinner has been warned by two coming to him whereby the sinner is finally turned over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus and at that point you turn your back and God in his time will take the unrepentant sinner sin unto death is related to willful stubborn sin where the person who's committing the sin knows that they are sinning they'll even admit that it's sin but they will not confess it to God and repent and God is patient sometimes he takes a long period of time and we wonder why is God not doing what he said he would do And the answer is, the Lord is merciful. The Lord is long-suffering. The Lord is gracious. The Lord is tender. The Lord is kind. But at some point, the sinner passes the point of no return. You've heard me preach entire series on the point of no return. It may be different for every person. God knows what it takes to woo a sinner back. God knows what it takes to break a sinner. God does what is necessary. And if there is no repentance, if the person is a believer, God takes them home. But if you be without chastisement, says Paul in Hebrews, for of all our partakers, then are you bastards and not sons. If you can continue to get away with your sin, no matter what you say with your lips in terms of you mouthing theology, if you can continue to get away with your sin and never come under the chastening hand of God, and the last line of chastening is death, if you can continue in sin and never be spanked, it's questionable whether or not you're saved No matter what you say with your mouth, it hasn't taken in your heart. If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart, how deep does it have to go? That God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. You see, when we're saved, we're not saved to sin. We're saved 
from sin. And you now have the enabling Holy Spirit dwelling inside of you, and you cannot say the sin and the temptation was too strong for me. God will always, 1 Corinthians 10, 13, make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. Now, people, why am I giving you this background? Because of the specific sin that is repeated over and over by Israel. The third statement by John ties us directly back to the golden calf and is this is the last verse in 1 John. John covers all the basic principles that we're studying in Exodus in his final epistle to the very last chapter and the very last verse. The golden calf principle is the very last thing that John warns against before writing the book of Revelation. What's the last verse in John's epistles? 1 John 5.21 Little children, keep yourselves from idols. What was the golden calf? You see, the sin of the golden calf is clearly something that applies to us today. Moses' response. And Moses turned and went down from the mount. And the two tables of the testimony were in his hand. The tables were written on both their sides. On the one side and on the other they were written. It's not the way that it's normally portrayed when you see pictures of Moses holding the Ten Commandments. They have Roman numerals, one, two, three, four, five, and on the second half, they sort of look like an arch thing. It you know, has the rest of it. It says they were written on the front and the back. And the tables were the work of God. And the writing was the writing of God, graven upon the tables. That first set God carved with his own finger in stone. And he didn't just carve numerals. He carved it out so that it could be read in Hebrew. And Joshua, when Joshua heard the noise of the people, they sh as they shouted, he said unto Moses, There's a noise of war in the camp. And he said, It is not the voice of them that shout for mastery. Neither is it the voice of them that cry for being overcome, but the noise of them that sing do I hear. And it came to pass as soon as he came nigh unto the camp that he saw the calf and the dancing. Moses is standing up. He's got a good view. He can see out over the whole camp. He's up on the mountain and he looks out. And he sees in the center of the golden calf. It was not something about as big as this light here. There were at least two million people who'd thrown in their earrings, you remember? They had some huge monstrosity. And they were offering sacrifices, and they're dancing nude, and they're fornicating all over the place. And the dancing in Moses' anger waxed hot, and he cast the tablets out of his hands and broke them beneath the mount. Now Moses was a very strong man. I hope you get that. When he was 120 years old and God took him home, it said his strength was not abated. His, his stride was not shortened. I mean, he was still strong, full health. He wasn't a rickety old man. And he takes the tablets. Think about even lifting something as big as this Bible here, this pulpit Bible, it's pretty big. And think about that. It's heavy, you know? And he takes that thing and he lifts it up. I think it was probably bigger than that. And it's stone, it's not paper. And he holds it up. You've seen pictures. And have you ever wondered? You look at it, it looks like stone. Was it this blown concrete that like our roof is here that's made that's so light? It was stone. And he took it and he smashed it. They'd already broken every one of the Ten Commandments. Now, you know, I would be afraid to smash the Ten Commandments like that if God had just given them to me. If I'd just seen the finger of God grind those words out in Hebrew. But Moses cared about the glory of God. 
Moses cared about the true worship of God. Moses cared about the moral purity and holiness of God. And many Christians today don't ever even think about holiness. And he broke them. And he took the calf which they had made and burnt it in the fire and ground it to powder. I suspect if anybody tried to stand in his way, he probably gave him a punch in the mouth, knocked him over with the elbow, gave him a kick in the knees, shoved his way through the camp and punched people as he went and got to the golden calf and he burned it. Nobody was going to stand in the way of the destruction of the golden calf, which they had all been so excited about, they got up early to go to worship. And he strawed it upon, he ground it to powder and strawed it upon the water and made the children of Israel drink it. I mean, this took some time here. And all this stuff is going on and Moses takes it. He grinds it to powder, gold powder, gold dust. And he dumps it in the water and he makes them, you, come on over here, one after another. Get going, now, drink it, drink it, drink it. His anger didn't settle down after he burned that calf and after he ground it up. He poured it in the water and he made him drink it. So you like golden calf? Here, have a taste. Have a swig of golden calf. See what it does to your innards. And Moses said unto Aaron, because see, he'd left Aaron in charge. It's like when a pastor goes away and he leaves somebody in charge. He comes back and finds all kinds of wickedness and chaos have been going on. Who do you check it with first? The one who gets left in charge. Moses said unto Aaron, What did this people unto thee? I mean, did they tie you down and put burning coals on your forehead and stomach? Uh, did they give you the waterboarding technique? I mean, did they beat you? Did they get a bunch of scorpions and threaten to pour them all over you if you didn't do what they told you to do? I mean, did they bury you up to your neck and then start kicking dust in your face? What did they do to you that you did something stupid and wicked like this? He gives Aaron, I'm not sure I would have given Aaron a chance, but he gives Aaron at least a chance to explain himself. You get the idea that Moses was mad? But what was he mad about? That you've wasted so much gold. Uh, that, 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 that you haven't uh, been keeping up on keeping the grounds clean around here because there's all this trash and rubbish around. And that wasn't what he was mad about. Why have you done this that you've brought so great a sin upon them. Do you get it? Moses cared about the people. He didn't want the people to sin. He knew what God would do to those who sinned. A good pastor cares for his people too and doesn't want to see them get involved in sin. Because even though God is patient, and long-suffering and gentle and kind someday there comes a point of no return and folks if you reach that point you can't go back book of Hebrews gives Esau as an illustration it says he repented he sought the blessing carefully with tears, but he was rejected. And he's given as a warning to the church. Those things were examples for us. Remember, that's what Paul says. We're dealing with the ones in the wilderness, but all of those examples in the Old Testament were given as illustrations for us so that we'll understand how God deals with sin and how God blesses obedience. You made the people to sin. And Aaron, ever the weasel, 
said, let not the anger of my Lord wax hot. He's going to pass the buck. Thou knowest the people that they are set on mischief. And Moses should have said perhaps, to, <laughs> I don't know what Moses should have said, but I think I probably would have said, oh, okay, yeah, I know the people. They're pretty bad. So why didn't you stand by them? Why didn't you tell them you're not going to be involved? Why didn't you say, you kill me first, but I will not let you get to worship a calf in front of the altar of God. You're going to have to kill me first. But he didn't do it. Aaron saw his brother was out of the picture, and wow, now it's time to sort of consolidate his own authority and power and what do you do you got to get the people doing something that they like to do and then they will sure recognize you as the big guy like a lot of the rock music in churches today that's what the people want the wiggling bodies on the stage and the strobe flashing lights and all the cool words that don't mean anything and don't go anywhere with music that doesn't go anywhere either and everybody loves it because they're wiggling their bodies into each other. People, if you're a leader, you have to stand up and say no. You're going to have to run me over first before you can get into that. Serious business. Oh, Moses, you know the people. I'm going to pass the buck. They're the ones that are set on mischief. They said unto me, and he's sort, of, he sort of quoting them, you know, doesn't exactly tell it how it happened. Make us gods which shall go before us. First, for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we want not what has become of him. And Aaron, you should have said, so what? God told you to wait here and quit being impatient. See, everything's got to do with impatience. And I said unto them, Whosoever hath any gold, let them break it off. Now, this is a disconnect. So, Aaron, why did you say that to them? I mean, like they said, we don't know what happened to Moses, so you said, bring me gold. There's a disconnect here someplace. Let them break it off, so they gave it to me. And I, being a, a good, righteous man and a good leader, I said, well, you know, I, I better not keep this gold for myself. I just throw it into the fire. That's what he says. I cast it into the fire. <laughs> and there came out this calf. Yeah, that molten gold, it just sort of flowed together into a calf. And because it was liquidy gold, that old calf comes wiggling out of the fire just like this. Whoa! And when it cooled off, it looked like a golden calf. Isn't that miraculous? Do you think God, maybe in the sovereignty of God, God made that happen? No, Aaron, you're responsible. Yes, God is sovereign, but every one of us is responsible for the actions that we take. We're responsible for our thoughts, words, deeds, motives, and attitudes. The five areas in which every believer will give an account someday before God. And even those little flippant words, you say, every idle word that men shall speak they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. And we know what they were doing because it says so in verse 25. When Moses saw that the people were naked, for Aaron had made them naked. Put the blame back where it is. Not on the people. Oh, the people were idiots to do all that stuff, but the people are carnal. But Aaron's a leader. Aaron has been in the presence of God. Aaron leads in the worship. Aaron leads in the sacrifices. Aaron makes the atonement on Yom Kippur, going behind the veil where the Holy of Holies is located. And upon the Ark of the Covenant, he sprinkles the blood. Every Joe Schmajkoff didn't know what Aaron knew, nor had every one of them been as close to God as Aaron had been. But Aaron had made them naked unto their shame among their enemies. 
Then Moses stood in the gate of the camp and said, Who is on the Lord's side? Let him come unto me. Did you know that there are sides and you have to take sides? Too many Christians want to just sort of wishy-washy down the middle. And we don't want to offend anybody over here. And that's the left wing. And we don't want to offend anybody over here, and that's the right wing. And we sure don't want to identify too, too, too sharply with these people here. And, and well, at least in this church, we don't want to identify too sharply with the people over here. Who is on the Lord's side? Have you personally ever made a commitment to be on God's side even if you have to die for it? You've got to do that. Who is on the Lord's side? That's the question Moses asked. That's the question you know it from the hymn, who is on the Lord's side, who will serve the king. But it's a question that the New Testament makes very clear for us too. We either stand with Christ or we stand against him. He that's not with me is against me, Jesus said. You must declare sides. Otherwise, you remain on the side where you started, which is the side against Christ. And all the sons of Levi gathered themselves together unto him. And he said unto them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel. This is not just Moses talking. This is divine revelation that he got to tell them. Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Jehovah. Put every man his sword by his side. Now God could have just killed them, and he did kill a whole bunch. But he wanted the people involved. He wanted the people who were on his side to demonstrate it, to take a stand. You know, God could save every one of the elect without using any one of us here in this congregation. He could have angels floating around in the heavens, everyone speaking a different language all over the face of the earth, and preaching the gospel through big megaphones. All ye down there, you're sinners. You're lost. You're going to go to hell. Let, let me show you what hell is like. And the big vision of hell opens up. Jesus died for your sins. Yes, Jesus, he's both God and man. He came to earth. He died on a cross. He died in your place. He took all your sins on him. And he not only died and was buried, but he rose the third day. He's alive. Do you know anybody else? Has anybody else in your culture ever been dead and gotten buried and then three days later popped out? Jesus did it. No. No. Down there I see you've got a purple stripe on your back here among the elect. Trust Jesus and be saved. Oh, you over there, I see you've got one of those purple stripes too. Trust Jesus and be saved. God could save every one of the elect without ever using you or me. But he has given us a command. It's not a suggestion. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. To wit that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. You and I have a job to do. When was the last time you showed up for work? And I'm talking about the spiritual work that God has called you to do. When was the last time you shared the gospel with somebody and you did not know if they were elect or non-elect? And it doesn't matter because God knows. But he's given you and me the privilege of sharing Christ. I was sitting on the platform of the train station after I flew back. It's a long story, but I mean I drove to the van all the way to Tennessee, gave it to Daniel Anastasi, rented a car, drove to Atlanta, because Knoxville is the most expensive airport in the entire United States to fly out of. And the ticket I got from Atlanta back to Philadelphia, 55 bucks, and that included all taxes. And only two hours instead of these hours and hours on the road. I mean, that's about the price that I paid for one tank of gas in the blue van. And I got back to Philadelphia, and I'm sitting there waiting for the train to take me to Central City. So I sat down on the bench next to this white guy probably in his late 50s and we started talking and he's a, a truck driver and um, 
you know, uh, he drives trucks to different places and then leaves them there and then he flies back to his home. And so I started sharing the gospel with him. And he kept nodding as though he agreed. And um, then I said, well, um, do you know for sure if you died tonight that you'd go to heaven? He says, oh, yes. I said, on what do you base that? Why do you think that God would let you into his heaven? Because you're a sinner. And he said, because I'm a Mormon. <laughs> you see, they talk about Jesus too. And they have Christ too. And they use all the same words that you do. But they don't believe the same thing that you do. They believe their Jesus is the brother to the devil. Did you know that? The Mormon Jesus and Satan are brothers? They believe that Jesus came and preached the gospel in the Americas. And that there are these huge wars between these northern Indians and these southern Indians and all kinds of horrible things happened. And their Jesus is a God. He's a created God. He's one of many gods and you can become a God too, just like Jesus. Their Jesus is not the Jesus of the Bible. He's a false Jesus. About that time, the train showed up and he got on one car and I got on another. Dear people, you have a job to do. Someday, when we die, there's going to be a judgment. But there are not going to be three at the judgment, Elohim and Jesus and Joseph Smith. There's going to be one the Lord Jesus Christ, the real Christ, the Christ of Scripture. And that man will be called to be judged. And Jesus will say to him, did you ever hear the true gospel? He was raised in Salt Lake City. He'll say, he can't lie about it. Yeah, one day there was this Christian preacher on a train platform in Philadelphia at the airport. And he told me about the real Jesus. Dear people, this is the job that God gave not just to the preacher. This is the job that God gave to you. When was the last time you showed up for work? Can't believe it, our time's up. Children of Levi did according to the word of Moses, their fellow the people that day, about 3,000 men. God could have killed those 3,000. He killed another 20,000. But he wants us to participate in the specific work to which he's called us. He didn't call you to gird on your sword and go out and kill a bunch of fornicating Israelites. But he called on you to gird on the sword of the Spirit and fight the battle of faith and share Christ with those who are under the power of Satan. Gracious Father, we thank you once again for your word and for its power. Your word is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. It pierces even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow. And it's a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Father, make us able soldiers in the battle. Cause us to be skilled in the use of our sword. Let us not be ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Let us wield it with faithfulness, with accuracy, with patience, and not backtrack, but stand our ground and fight a good fight of faith. Make us the witnesses that you have commanded us to be. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn for today is number 316. It's about the cross of Christ. That's the only thing that gives you hope, his death, burial, and resurrection. Jesus, the God-man, the sacred head, what now wounded, 
with grief and shame weighed down. Let's stand to sing number 